Hello everybody, this is Pastor Green. We're doing another Bible study, 1 Kings chapter 8. We're starting with uh, 1 Kings 8, uh, verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chiefs of the fathers of the children of Israel, with the king Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of Covenant to the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. We have a look at this picture here. Um, currently, or at least in the last couple of years, you can see the picture on the left. That's what the uh, city of David looked like. Uh, you can see in the very back the mask of Omar. Mosque of Omar, I mean, and apparently, you know, obviously that wasn't there during Solomon's time. The temple would have been on that mount up there. And then you can see on the left, on the right hand side, you know, around the area where it would be at, the water gate, the, the valley gate, fortifications. And you can see what it looks like right there. And there's stairway in the very bottom to come into it. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves into King Solomon at the feast of the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And if you look at the chart here, it kind of tells you on the left the Hebrew calendar names, middle, how many days is in the month, and then the, the corresponding Gregorian month. And if you look at the month of um, Ethium, it's going to be right around September or October. This is what the uh, Jewish calendar kind of looks like right here. And you can see the month right here. It's right there between October and September. And you can also see it on this on this calendar as well. You can see it's right here in the month of October and September. And they brought the Ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those that the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the Ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told or numbered for multitude. This is the first time the temple was used for anything, so they wanted to make sure the whole entire temple was consecrated, hallowed. They sacrificed a lot of animals there because they wanted to make this a special occasion. And the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to the place, or to the Oracle of the House, in the most holy place, even on the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth her two wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubims covered the Ark and the stabs there as about. This is gonna they're gonna take the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And if you want to know more about the Ark, you have to go to Exodus and read about that. Uh, but they took this cherubim in there. They took the, the Ark and they put it in the middle of the temple in between the two cherubims. And um the verbal descriptions have led many different ideas of what this might have looked like. And after intensive research, I've decided that I don't know, and probably nobody knows what it really looked like. But here's a couple of pictures of what the Ark of the Covenant could have looked like. This right here is a really nice one here. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant had two angels whose wings were outstretched, touching each other. Their faces looked down at the middle of the mercy seat, and that's where the blood was applied. Another picture right here. You can see the cobwebs on it. This is another picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Another picture right here. In Hebrews 9 it says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first where it was the candlesticks of the temple, and the showbread, which was called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle that was called the holiest of all. Again, if you go to Exodus, you can read all about the temple and all the different ways the temple put together and how it looked. But you can kind of see this little rough drawing here. You walk into the tabernacle. There's going to be the golden lampsticks there on the right, on the left there, the table of showbread on the left. And then there's this big, huge curtain, and we're going to go really shortly into this big curtain here. And behind that curtain was the Holiest of Holies. Nobody was allowed back there, except for on special occasions. There was a, a Levite that was picked to go back there and, and sacrifice and, and put blood on the altar of the Ark. And it says here in the Jewish tradition that two curtains separated the Holiest of Holies from the Lesser Holy Place during the pe period of the Second Temple. And these curtains were woven with moths directly for the loom, rather than embroiled. Each of the cur each of the curtains had a thickness of a hand breadth, or about nine centimeters. If you look at your palm, if you go from basically right where your thumb meets the hand, all the way to the other side of the palm, that's going to be a hand breadth. So about nine centimeters, or about three or four inches long. 
and it was really, really thick. There's been a bunch of different uh, studies and tests done, and it was almost impossible. In fact, I don't think it even has been possible to rip it. But you can see this great big, huge, I think it was like 20, 20 foot or so. I'm not, you know, don't quote me on that, but it was this great big, huge curtain that was there that prevented you from going into the holiest of holies. In Luke 23, it says it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. This is at Jesus' crucifixion. Matthew 27. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And it's really important to see that, the, that this veil was broken from the top to the bottom. It's so high up, nobody could have used their hands to rip it or used a knife to rip it because it was too high for anybody to reach. It had to be done from, with God. So the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom. This is just a picture right here. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. And you can see this little picture here of, of the tabernacle curtain getting ripped. And this right here says, as, as such, the veil represented the separation between God and man, the separation caused by sin. At Christ's death, the separation was removed, and mankind could have direct access to God the Father. And it's symbolized by tearing into this thick and heavy veil. Yes, it was Christ's sacrifice that took away the veil. The veil was originally put there because only certain Levites, the, the holiest of all the priests, could actually go in there. And it was like a, um, a blessing or a, a privilege to be able to go back there. And it was one of those situations where it was almost like we are separated from God. And only the certain few could go into God on our behalf. And after Christ's death, it was symbolizing ripping this, this curtain in two, saying that now we have direct access to the Father through Jesus. Hebrews 9 says, Which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, the tab tables of the covenant, so the golden pot of manna, if you read, read the book of Exodus, the people were traveling around and they were hungry, so they prayed to God, and God rained manna from heaven, which was a type of sweet bread, came from heaven to feed them. So they collected, the, they collected this manna in a little pot, they put that in the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod that budded, Moses had this rod, and he would go around and he used the rod. He hit the, the seas and the seas bled, and he hit the seas and the seas split. And once he passed, he gave it to Aaron. Well, once he passed, they wanted to figure out who was going to lead the people. So God told the people, whoever holds this staff and it buds, that's going to be the person that's going to lead the people. And so Aaron was holding the staff and it budded. And so they put that in the Ark of Covenant as well. In the Tables of the Covenant, that's the Ten Commandments. They also put that inside the tabernacle in the Ark of the Covenant. And you can see right here the, the bowl of manna, the rod, the butter, the Ten Commandments. It was all put inside the Ark of the Covenant. And basically it says here the golden pot had manna. And that's God's provision for his people. That's letting you know that God can provide for his people. The rod that budded is God showing who he wants to be in leadership. And the tables of the covenant is God makes his laws clear for all to read. 1 Kings 8 and They drew out the staffs, and at the ends of the staffs were seen in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and they were until this day. There was nothing in the ark save two tables of stone which Moses put in there at Hiram, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the clouds filled with the house of the Lord. So all they found in the ark was the Ten Commandments. So the priest could not stand and minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spoke Solomon, the Lord has said he would dwell in the thick darkness. So if you read the book of Exodus, they're making the tabernacle. As they're going out of the promised land, God led them with this smoke, and they followed this cloud. And at nighttime it was a fiery, fiery cloud. So they were able to follow God, and then finally God rested on the spot where they made the tabernacle. And you always knew where God was because you could see this cloud. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settling place for thy to abound in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel, and all the congregation of Israel stood. And now we're going to have King Solomon is going to be talking to his people. And he said, 
Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake to the mouth and to David, my father, who has with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the days that I brought forth thy people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house, that my name might be then thereof. But I chose David to be over the people of Israel. So God told David, I'm going to let you build me a house, but it won't be you, it'll be one of your sons. So if you look here on the map, the, the top's going to be the brief view of history. The bottom you can see, Moses built the first tabernacle, and then David, well, David's son, built him a temple. You can see here where the flood was, and now there's Moses right there. And then there's King David. And if you zoom in, you'll see here's David. And here's Moses to David. It was about 400 years that... Um, Basically, they had the tabernacle. They would travel all around with this tabernacle. They'd take it down. They'd build it back up again. They'd travel all over the place. Until finally, David said, I want to build you a temple. And God said, I will accept that, but you're not going to build it. Your son's is going to build it. And that, was, that would be Solomon. And I was in the heart of David, my father, who built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thy heart to build me a house unto my name, Thou didst well that I was in thine heart. So God saying, David, I really appreciate you loving me so much you want to build me a house. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son shall come forth out of thy loins, and he shall build a house unto my name. And the Lord has performed his work that he spoke, and I am risen up in the room with David my father, and I sit up on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and I have built a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And I've set there a place for the ark, where is the covenant of the Lord, which is made with our fathers, when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel, and spread forth his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee, in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all thy heart, who was kept with thy servant David, my father, who thou promisedest. Thou speaketh also with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thy hands as to this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, that thou promised him, saying, they shall, not fail these, they shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit at the throne of Israel, so that thy children can take heed in their way, that they walk before me as thou walk before me. And now, or, or God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou speaketh unto my servant David the father. But will God indeed dwell upon the earth? Behold, the heaven and the earth of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less is this house that I have built? Yet, I have, yet thou have respected unto the prayers of thy servants and unto their supplication. O Lord my God, the hearken unto the cry and to the prayer, which thy servant prayeth before thee to the day. Solomon's saying, God, you're just so amazing. You're so, you're so spectacular that I built you a house. But would you actually live in it? I mean, heaven can't even contain thee. You're, you're so amazing. Is this is this is this house worthy of you? That thine eyes may be open toward the house day and night, even toward the place of thou hast said, My name shall be there. Thou mayest hearken unto the prayers which thy servant shall make towards thee in this place, and hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant, and upon thy people Israel, when they shall pray towards this place, and hear it in thy heaven, a dwelling place, and when thou hearest forgive. And any man trespassed against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before that archer of this house. Then hear thou in heaven, and do, and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked, and bringing his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. So he's saying, if anybody sins against you, and you basically make him feel guilty that he needs to come to you, hear, hear, hear what he says. When he comes in the temple to pray for you, hear what he says and judge him if he's wicked then condemn him but if he's but if he's righteous justify him do do according to his heart do 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 what you feel must be done and when thy people israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn against it to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication to thee the house then hear thy in heaven and forgive the sins of the people of Israel, and bring them again to the land which thou hast graven to their fathers. He's saying when Israel, when, 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 when your people sin against you, and you punish us, and you, you send war and plagues and famine to us, when we realize our mistake and we pray to you, hear us and forgive us. You know, he's basically asking God to, to help them and, and judge us righteously 
But if we truly, if we truly mean we're, for, you know, we're sorry, to please forgive us. In John one it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we say that everybody sins, but if we choose to confess our sins and be faithful, God's going to forgive us our sins because we are we're being faithful and righteous. Proverbs 28 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He's saying that if you try to hide your sins, well, you're not going to prosper. But if you say, oh, Lord, I made a mistake, please forgive me, then God will have mercy upon you. Psalms 32, a psalm of David. Blessed is he that transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man into which the Lord impueth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. Acknowledge my sins unto thee, and my iniquity I have not hid. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and I will forgive us the iniquity of my sin, Selah. He's saying that, you know, I, I've made a mistake, but yet I'm coming to you and I'm acknowledging my sin. I'm saying I made a mistake, and I can't hide my iniquity from you, and he's going to forgive you. Acts 3, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. The time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. God, He's saying, you know, if you for, if you ask God to forgive you, this book that the angels are writing up in heaven of everything you've thought or said or done, it'll get blotted out, it'll get erased because you've said, Lord, please forgive me. Back to First Kings eight thirty five, when the heaven is shut up and there's no rain, because of they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place, they confess thy name and turn from their sin. When thou hast afflicted them, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sins of thy servant and of the people of Israel, that thou teach them a good way wherein they should walk, and give rain upon the land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. So it's like, it's, it's God, if, if we sin against you to the point where you shut up the heavens and don't give us rain because we sinned against you, <clears throat> if we pray in this temple and we confess our sins and we turn from our sins, then then hear our, our cries and forgive us and give us that rain. Isaiah 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that that cannot save, neither his ears heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid their face from you that he will not hear. So he's saying, God's hand's not short, he can still save you. His ears not heavy that he can't hear you. But when you sin, when you make a mistake, God's not going to hear you until you ask for that forgiveness. Micah 3 says, Then they come cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at the time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. So if you cry to the Lord and you haven't for, you know, asked for forgiveness of your sins, God's not going to hear you. Back to 1 Kings 8, 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, or if there be caterpillar, if the enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, where forever plague, what sort of sickness there be, what well, prayers and supplications so with ever made by any man, or by all the people of Israel, we shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his, house, his hands towards his house. If there's famine and pestilence and all these bad things because of our, our sins, we're going to pray to you, Lord. And then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do and give every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou even thou knowest the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee in all the days of their living the land, and thou shalt grave us one of their fathers. It's saying, if all these bad things happen, we know we deserve it. But when we pray, we ask for forgiveness. If we truly mean it, because Lord, you know our hearts. You know what's inside of us. Please forgive us. Please please accept us and help us. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people, Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, for they shall hear of the great name, and of the strong hand, and of the stretched out arm, we shall come and pray towards his house. He's saying that even if somebody's a stranger that aren't your people, or Israelites, and they come here hearing about all the great things you've done, and they come to your house, it says, Hear thou in heaven 
a dwelling place, and do according to all the stranger called thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, and to do thy people Israel, that they may be known in this house, which I have built it, and called by thy name. If thy people go out in battle against their enemy, whithereover thou shalt send them, and they shall pray unto the Lord towards the city, which thou hast chosen, and towards the house that I have built for my name. He's saying, even if a stranger comes in, who doesn't know you, but has heard all these tales about all the great things you've done, you know, you 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 need to. He- we want you. I want you to heal them, and, and and answer them because of the faith this guy has, this stranger. Because he's going to go back to his hometown, saying, "Wow, this God is so amazing." He wants all the people of the earth to know. He's not stingy and keeping it for the Israelites. He wants everybody to know. And if we have a battle and we pray to you, we want you to help us. Then hear thou in heaven their prayers and their supplications, and maintain their cause. And if they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they can carry them away captive into the land of the enemy far and near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land where they carry captive, and repent, and make supplication to thee in the land that they carry them captive, saying, We have sinned, and we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so shall return thee in their heart, with all thy soul in the land of their enemies, which they led them away captive. I pray unto thee towards their land, which thou givest to their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, the house which they have built for their name. He's saying that if we get into a battle because of our sin, and they take us away because of our sin, if we realize, wow, we've sinned, we're so sorry, and we actually repent, we actually mean what we say, and we realize we made a mistake, you know, help us and be there with us. Then hear their prayers and their supplication to heaven in thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions where they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carry them captive, that they may have compassion on them. He's saying, we, we want you to, if we're captives and we, we ask for forgiveness and really mean it, we want our captors, the people that have kidnapped us, to have compassion for us, because we want the whole entire world to know how amazing you are. For they be thy people and thy inheritance, which thou brought us forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron, that thy eyes may be opened unto the supplication of thy servant, and upon the supplication of thy people Israel, to hearken to them, that they may call unto thee. He's saying, Lord, you took us out of bondage, out of slavery, and you've given us this new life. And when we realize we've made a mistake and we repent and we really mean it, we want you to we want you to be with us, because we're your we're your inheritance that you took out of bondage. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant, when thou brought us out of the fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. You know, Germany can pass and enforce laws in their country, and other countries can use them as if they like. Japan can pass and enforce laws in their country, and other countries can use them and model them if they like. The Martin family here can pass and enforce rules in their house. And other families can use them and model them if they like. The city of San Jose can pass and enforce laws in our city. And other cities can use them and model them if they like. But see, here's the thing. If you look at Kings, 1 Kings 53, it says, or 1 Kings 8, 53, For thou didst separate us for them among the people of earth, to be thine inheritance, when thou brought us thy fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. He's saying, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they are his inheritance. And he can enforce any rules he wants on them. See, the children of Israel have to follow all these rules. Everybody else doesn't. Because, but we want we want people to see how great our God is, and maybe they, they take over and they start doing the things we do. And it was so, and when Solomon had made an end to the praying of all this prayer and supplication of the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread unto heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that have given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of his God promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. He said, God, be with us. We're building this temple for you. We want to be your people. We're going to make mistakes, and we understand you're going to judge us. But if we come to you and we're sorry... We ask you to forgive us, and, to, to, and if we repent, we ask you to be with us. 
The Lord our God be with us, and he was with our fathers. Let them not leave us nor forsake us. He may incline our hearts unto him, and walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And let this be my words, whereof I have made supplication before the Lord. Be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintaineth the cause of his servant, and the cause of his people Israel at all times, as a matter shall be required. Let all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God, and there is none else. He's saying, we want to be this special people, that everybody around us goes, wow, I want to be like them. Let your heart therefore be perfect in the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments, as to this day. And the king and the Israel of him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering, which he offered unto the Lord, two and twenty thousand oxen, twenty-two thousand oxen, and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. And the king of all the children of Israel dedicated his house to the Lord. And the same day the king hallowed the, the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for they have offered burnt offerings and meat offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar was that before the Lord was too little to receive their burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. And people ask what the word hallowed means. It says holy, consecrated the church stands on hallowed ground, sacred, reverend the university hallowed as halls of hallowed customs. The word hallowed means something that's holy. Hallows all throughout the Old Testament. You even get to see it in the New Testament. Exodus and Deuteronomy, it says, don't take the name of the Lord or God don't hold him guiltless. Take his name in vain. Lord's, the Lord's name is hallowed. You know, we think of, of cemeteries as hallowed ground. We think of churches as hallowed ground. You can see these different books by people about hallowed ground. And we have lots of hallowed ground memorials all over America. Places that are sacred, holy, things we care about. Things we don't want to, that actually mean something to us. This right here is the state of Alabama's Confederate Memorial Park. Right here is the Venice Memorial Park in East, in uh, Exits County Parks. It's hallowed ground. It's a place where we're, 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 we're taking honor to somebody who passed away. See, atheists really can't celebrate Christian holidays because they don't believe in Christian things. They don't believe in Jesus. They say happy birthday Darwin. They celebrate Reverend Charles Darwin's birthday and pretend he was a scientist even though he wasn't. Jews and Christians have lots of hollow days where we remember things like the Passover, the birth of Christ, the resurrection. Atheists also have a national holiday, April Fool's Day. The Bible says in Psalms 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Back to 1 Kings 8. And at that time, Solomon held a feast, and all of Israel was with him, a great congregation for the entry of Hadamah to the rivers of Egypt before the Lord our God. Seven days, and, seven days and seven days, even 14 days. Solomon had a great big feast. Fruits, vegetables. This looks like a really good feast to me. And on the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went into their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the gladness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions, you can always email me or just comment below. I'm going to put a couple links on the screen here. Bottom right is going to be the First Kings Bible Study. The top left is going to be Exodus Bible Study. You can learn about the tabernacle and the ark if you go to the Exodus Bible study. In the bottom left is going to be a video YouTube things you're going to like. I appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions, just let me know. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Tell your friends about it. I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.